thank you so much uh, for, the, for the very warm welcome, despite the weather. Uh, and I'm just really honored to, to, to be here. So thank you for the invitation. Um, that was a long list of things that I'm expected to deliver. Uh, and, and I'm sorry if, if I disappoint anybody. Um, I, I am a human geographer, which is to say a social scientist. Um, but I've long been working, uh, not long, in the last several years, working with a lot of natural scientists, people who work as ecologists and marine biologists. Um, so you're going to see a lot of that influence in here, um, which I hope, you know, don't be scared of the graphs and the quantitative stuff. That's actually the point of my talk, which is how to work with and why to work with other kinds of scientists. Um, and, you know, as a, as a geographer and as a social scientist, my work uh, normally is much more, I would say, closely related to questions of culture and humanities uh, from a humanities perspective. Um, so this is a bit of a venture for me as well. Um, so it'll just hopefully bear with me and maybe by the end of the talk, I'll kind of circle back toward what might be a uh, kind of digital humanities uh, perspective a little bit. Um, so I'm going to be going back and forth between reading and not reading. Uh, so I'll try to make it as lively as I can, um, but I do need to time myself. So I'm gonna start the clock. Okay. So much of my research has involved working with fishers or fishermen in the Northeast of the United States, itself quite famous for relatively small scale fishing communities that dot the coast from North Carolina all the way up to the Canadian border. I'm interested in these communities because many could be characterized as sites of local or community economy. That is, economies that foreground livelihoods and well-being over profit and accumulation. That such community economies are resident in the very urban and industrialized northeast of the United States, that they have survived waves of neoliberal resource management measures that prioritize privatization, and that they continue <coughs> to innovate on behalf of community and environmental well-being. All of this, I think, suggests processes and practices that are clearly outside of hegemonic understandings of fishing as the, prof as the practice of profit-driven individuals. So there's much going on in fisheries in the Northeast of the United States that's of interest to scholars like myself, people who are interested in alternative economic possibilities uh, and how those might be really made visible and amplified, perhaps in the form of ethnographic or workshop settings, perhaps in terms of sort of face-to-face -face engagements that explore relationalities constitutive of fishing community and fishing commons, where none are really thought to, presume, uh, thought to exist. So here I should note that much of my work is within the growing subfield of geography that's known as diverse economies. This subfield seeks to dislodge our understanding of the economy as a singular and universally capitalist economy. It recasts the economy as a diverse field making visible a diversity of economic practices and processes sort of here and now that we all might be engaged in and we don't recognize as such. The goal is to enlarge the horizon of economic and livelihood possibilities. So, inspired by this diverse economies tradition, my own research has focused on making visible processes of community and commons, community economies that have been hidden by dominant understandings of the fishing economy. In particular, I've used maps as a device to solicit map-based stories of cooperation rather than competition, uh, stories about the exchange of environmental knowledge, the concern for community and environmental survival that does exist among fishing communities. How do I advance slides? Let's see. No problem. That was easy. Um, these projects have not only worked to document a fishing other present within the industrial fisheries of the Northeast, but have also been entangled with novel community economy initiatives such as community supported fishing. 
This is in particular a small initiative in Port Clyde, Maine, a very small rural community in the, in the northern coast of, of the United States. And community-supported fishing is similar to community-supported agriculture, if you've heard of this. Uh, I'm not sure, but it's a crop sharing or a subs subscription approach to connecting uh, consumers of food with direct uh, producers of food. Often small farmers uh, set up uh, community supported agriculture where you subscribe to an annual amount of produce. The fishermen in Port Clyde did this with fish. So in Port Clyde, in part inspired by seeing their community and fishing commons laid out before them on a map in one of the projects that I was engaged in, these fishermen worked hard to develop an alternative market for their catch that respected community and environmental needs. And I can go into more detail if, if you're interested. Um, I call these map-based projects and the data from which the maps are derived communities at sea, this is the term I use, because they map the locations at sea frequented by particular communities. So in Port Clyde, we did all this work around maps where they could see that they go fishing over here, and here's the port, and making this direct connection between the environment, the fishing resources, the community, and then a direct link to the consumer. Very interesting. Um, while fishers know these locations in the ocean intimately, <coughs> seeing them expressed as a territory as a site of a shared dependency and possibly as an environment to care for works to challenge these hegemonic notions of fishers as independent, free roaming, and individually utility maximizing. Rather than putting, say, for example, fishing effort on the map or putting quantities of catch on the map or the value of catch on the map, which is very typical of fisheries management, the work that I do tries to put communities on the map, making them visible to fishery science and management, making them visible to planners, and in the case of Port Clyde, making them visible to fishermen themselves. So in these projects, it's clear that the face-to-face -face matter that is working with fishermen directly over a map, that the workshop was vital and productive and clearly a site of a kind of resubjectification around economic and environmental issues. It was also clear, however, that the maps themselves did much of the work needed for such rethinking. The maps offered a place that fishers and other community members could fill with their own histories, livelihoods, meanings, and perhaps their own creative economic potentials. Thinking in these terms is to be attentive to the ontological politics. I'm sorry if you were looking for politics, politics. I'm more interested in ontological politics, the politics of categories, processes, and the worlds that those categories and processes inscribe, or what we might say, perform. The idea that maps might perform a world of communities and commons was, for me, very useful in terms of my own imagining of the research I could do, the, the engagements I could design, the people I could work with, and the new economies that such work might bring into being. So, uh, however, over the last decade or so, I cannot but worry about the limits of these relatively small community-engaged projects. Not as necessary or a permanent limitation, but as limitations nonetheless. Limitations that might hamper the durability of such initiatives in the face of, for example, a management regime in theories that's making access to marine resources harder and harder. In the face of a rapidly developing wind energy sector that <coughs> threatens to displace fishers from traditional fishing grounds. In the face of conservation mandates to save 30% of the ocean and stop fishing in those locations. And in the face of ongoing transformations of oceans due to climate change. These are extraordinary and powerful phenomena that have been busy territorializing the ocean through their wielding of ever-expanding digital inventory of marine life, environments, and human engagement, through their well-funded advocates and organizations, and through uh, an increasing propensity to align their interests with each other through things like ocean planning, data portals, and best decision-making 
practices, all of which it's hard, it's not hard to see, make less visible small-scale fishing and the lived experiences and places of fishing communities. So that's kind of what we're up against, right? Uh, the big monster and the little guy. So I don't mean to dampen our diverse economies or maybe third sector uh, spirits and suggest that innovative practices of fishing communities are always short-lived and ultimately failed experience experiments. On the contrary, I wish to suggest that we need to work hard to document how those other concerns, wind energy, climate change, conservation, and so on, how are they successful at territorializing the ocean? How do they do it? And shouldn't we be doing something comparable? How might we struggle on behalf of community and commons within green planning initiatives, within data portal websites, within the range of emerging decision-making <coughs> tools, and within the analytics of environmental and climate change. Right? So how is it we can see those sites where so much work is being done, so much is being invested, so much money is pouring as places where we can uh, make visible and engage community and commons. So one way might be to recognize that such territorializations are largely driven by the formation of what we might call a digital ocean. The ocean as known, understood, managed, and exploited through a host of digital apparatus. Taking that as our starting point, how might we associate communities and commons with such apparatus? How can we make them digital and algorithmic rather than simply cartographic? How can we make them territorializing rather than just representational? So to do so uh, is to recognize and foreground the fact that the data I work with, the maps I make, are digital. <laughs> they are algorithmic in some sense. Uh, and let me just show you a few slides to kind of get at that. Um, so, you know, you don't need to read this algorithm or know it, don't be afraid of it. I'm, I'm always afraid of these kinds of things initially, and I've gotten really used to it over the last few years, and I, I'm beginning to enjoy it, which is a little scary. So, what we did was we took data, the data that I work with are the logbook data of fishermen, which is to say fishermen who go fishing, they record all this information, they have to, uh, for the federal government, and one of the things they record is where they went. And so all those little dots are the location of a fishing trip. And the color of the dot represents the community from which they came. And what you immediately start to see is that there are clusters of color, right? Which is to say, particular communities fish on particular fishing grounds. Like, it's not a big surprise, right? But this data, which is from the federal government, is never used in this sense. It's never used from a social science perspective to try to think about people, patterns, uh, habits, and so on, right? It's actually used uh, to um, manage fish stock, right? Like, that's what it's used for. So this is a real different use of it. And so the algorithm on the right, what it does is it simply clusters the data. It takes all these dots and it groups it by community. Uh, and if you group by community, uh, you know, you use your fancy GIS and you, and you take what's on the, on the upper left is all of the fishing trips for, for several decades. This data goes back to 1994. So we now have 25, over 25 years of data for this. Um, and you can start to group it and aggregate it in all kinds of ways. And you can start making maps that really zoom in on where does Point Pleasant, New Jersey, very close to where I live now, where do they go fishing? And where do they go fishing on average? How has it changed over 25 years? Do they fish in the same place? Have they moved? Right? All these kinds of questions you can start asking of the data. And in general, you can go from, this is a little facetious, but kind of go from, in the upper left, a kind of um, statistical image of the ocean as a site of collecting data about fish stock, Right, that map is from the National Marine Fisheries Service, to something on the, on the bottom right, which is a map that I made, which is like a map that shows this is a human and populated landscape. Right? That all of those different fishing communities as different colored blobs indicate places of relationship between community and commons, arguably, that is consistent over time. Okay, so as it turns out, the data that I use 
is rather compatible with, rather than contrary to, statistics enumeration and integration with other calculations. And it's this quality, the algorithmic aspect of the communities at sea data that I use, that I would like to trace here. And this is my big question. If the power of the map was its capacity to perform community and commons for a handful of fishers in Port Clyde, that I worked with before, uh, and subsequently contribute to the assemblage and performance of a new and progressive economy around fish, community sported fishing, like if a map can do that, what might the algorithm do if integrated into and with other more powerful agencies? What would happen if it, if it was associated with other actors and devices whose reach was decided, decidedly much further than Port Clyde, and whose durabilities are more likely, given the wide-ranging support and investment that such de devices uh, garner. That's the big question. OK. So while this presentation then traces the path of an algorithm and its increasing entanglements with uh, the digital ocean. It also traces a movement, I would argue, from representation to a kind of territorialization. From a logic of simply putting communities on the map and hoping that the government recognizes them and gives them some kind of rights or access, to a logic of coordination with other oceanic processes and actors. A logic of combination that explicates the relationalities between community dynamics and other oceanic processes, practices, and emergent economies, whether they be blue economy or otherwise. I'm kind of skipping ahead here, so hang on. OK. So like other social scientists, I've been drawn into interdisciplinary projects, uh, particularly around climate change. They always want a social scientist. They're like, we've got, we got to get the big grant, so we need the social scientist. Um, and, they all, and they always call me up because they're like, Kevin, you know how you know about people and the marine environment. I say this thing. Uh, and so I, I end up as part of these large interdisciplinary projects that are focused on uh, climate change, and you have you end up you end up in these kinds of graphs. So that model on the upper left. You know, it's not done by a social scientist. That's like typical of the ecologist. They are thinking in terms of, of systems, right? And systems that are almost always natural systems where uh, human engagement is some kind of force that disrupts the natural system. Um, and there's always some feedback loop and so it goes around in circles. And I would argue that my big coup as a member of these um, interdisciplinary projects is that that little diagram actually says community on it, right? In the upper left, you have fishing communities that are part of this system, right? And they're given nearly as much weight as the other elements in the system, right? So this is sort of, I'm quite proud of that. Um, and in this case, this is a system where climate change is, is rapidly transforming the system. On the upper right-hand side, you can see two simple graphs that show um, lines going up. And what that refers to are different species of commercially important fish. Uh, and their center of gravity, as it were, in terms of abundance, is, is moving north up the coast of the United States, which is to say water is getting warmer. And fish that are adapted, they're very highly sensitive to water temperature. They need to go further north to get uh, cool, cooler water. Their habitat is moving much quicker than uh, you know, fish respond much more quickly than trees to changes in temperature and where they can be found. They follow, you know, the temperature gradient. Okay, and so then what is the relationship then between that movement of species and community practices? And then so on the bottom you see two other graphs, one of which says that this community of Beaufort, North Carolina, is also moving north, which is to say the uh, where they go fishing has changed over time. But then there are other communities like Stonington, Connecticut, that simply haven't changed at all. So the question is like, what's the relationship between changes in environment due to climate and changes in, in human practice? That's sort of the, the big question there. Um, but for me, it's a little bit different as to why I'm engaged. Of course, I'm interested in climate change and the problems of adapting to it. 
But I also saw this working with these scientists as an opportunity to trace this communities at sea data that I developed. To see what work that data might do as an algorithm rather than a map. I was interested to use the larger and more powerful agencies of climate change research, its funding, publication, influence on policy, right, as a vehicle to amplify and multiply where and how communities and commons might be performed. So shifting from that face-to-face -face project with my friends in Port Clyde to like, okay, let's talk about community everywhere that you're talking about. Okay. So it's important to note that the very algorithmic aspect of communities at sea contributed to its acceptance by my environmental science colleagues. Which is to say, while, while they're always interested in having science, the social scientists on board, those interdisciplinary projects, there's often a pretty hard line epistemologically between what the social scientist does and what the environmental scientist does. But here, there was a recognition across that boundary, right? Um, while community is a vague unit of analysis, even to the social scientist, it became recognizable to everyone on the project insofar as it was derived from an extensive data set, they love data sets, log that go back to 1994, was manipulated by a particular programming language, was open to exploration via a range of spatial statistics, and was capable of being represented in tabular, graphic, and map form, much like the biophysical data and ecosystemic units of analysis used regularly by me. In short, communities at sea lent itself to algorithmic combinations and associations, which arguably guaranteed its use and success as a shared object, what some people might call a boundary object, uh, a shared object of analysis in these interdisciplinary climate change projects. In addition, as algorithm community at sea could do more than represent communities, it could do more than just put community <coughs> on the map. Indeed, as an algorithm and in the hands of skilled researchers, such as those that I've worked with, the dynamics and capacities of communities could be interrogated and combined with those of climate change. Uh, and therefore, uh, intervene in the digital ocean. Okay. So I'm going to talk about a, a few of these projects just to give you a flavor of what that might look like and what those potentials might be. Um, and I've got a bunch of them, but I'm only going to do a few uh, in given, given the time that we have. Okay, so the first project that I want to mention was an analysis uh, that examined how fishing communities have responded to changing environmental conditions. In particular, this movement poleward right, as they say, the northern movement of, of commercially important species in the northeast. What we found was that communities composed of, and this is not surprising, but um, it is now documented in data, which makes it more useful. What we found was that communities composed of large vessels were more mobile and could follow species as they shifted north, whereas communities made up of smaller vessels did best when they fished a diversity of species. The results point to diversity of catch and mobility of, of fishing location as important to climate change adaptation. Also along the way, the analysis notes the decline, indeed the disappearance, of many smaller communities that were unable to diversify in the face of environmental change. So let me just show you a few scary graphs that we can talk about. So in the, on the top, we see two boxes. On the left, it says large vessels. On the right, it says small vessels. And the, and the frequency graph is simply showing you that where, you've, where you have a tall bar, you have lots of communities at that point. On the x-axis, the axis, the x-axis is saying, uh, did this community move latitudinally? Did it go north? or not. And the uh, small vessels, what you see is the, the great majority of small vessel communities do not move latitudinally. They don't, they don't move north to south. And on the left-hand side, for large vessels, what you see is more of them move 
latitudinally. Not as many as you think. It's not like they're all moving. Indeed, most of them are not moving. But there are some of these small, uh, large vessel communities that do indeed move latitudinally. And the maps on the bottom simply illustrate the same. The map on the left is for large vessels. And you can see Beaufort, North Carolina, way in the south, the location of that port. And all the dots that kind of emanate from Beaufort are uh, year to year. Where can you find this community fishing? Oh, further and further and further north. They are indeed following a specific species of fish called summer flounder that is one of the most sensitive to climate change and has moved north quite rapidly. And that particular port also happens to specialize in catching summer flounder. They don't have many other choices. There aren't many other species where they are. And to remain profitable, they have to keep following the fish. The other port at the top, Portland, Maine, uh, virtually no latitudinal moment, uh, movement relative to where they fish year to year. They're staying right where they are. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, the same for smaller communities, very few of which show any latitudinal motion at all. OK. So this paper, um, let me see if I have another slide here. And one more slide, uh, just the boxes on the top, the one on the bottom we won't look at. On the top, we have x and y axes. And, on, and here, looking at not just mobility, right? The other adaptation strategy is to diversify the catch of species, to simply move from one species to another rather than move with the species. Uh, and if you, the, on the bottom, the x-axis is an index of the degree to which a fishing community have, fishes for a diversity of species. The further you are on the, to the right of the x-axis, the higher the diversity of your catch. The further to the left on the x-axis, you're really only specializing in one species. The y-axis is saying, are they moving latitudinally? So those large boats on the left, what you see is there, some of them are highly specialized. Some of them fish a diversity of species. But there is a relationship between mobility and diversity, which is to say the less diverse you are, you're more specialized. You're going to move with those things. And on the right-hand side, what you see is these, those small vessels, no matter whether they're diverse or not, they are not following fish. They're staying where they are. The catch, though, is there's two different kinds of dots. There are black dots and there are hollow dots. The black dots are fishing communities that exist today. The hollow dots are those that disappear over time. So what do you see? You see that if they're less diversified in their catch, they're less likely to survive, right? That the more diverse they are, the more likely they've, they've survived. OK. So there was a kind of sadness built into this as well, because we, you could see so many different communities uh, disappearing. OK, so one way to view this paper is as a rather compelling story about the fate of fishing communities over the last 20 years delivered via spatial statistics. While it is meant to document adaptations and responses to change in species range, it also, from the perspective of a fishery social scientist, implies dramatic changes, not only in fishing practices, but changes in communities, livelihoods, employment, mobility, and so on. That is, fishing hundreds of kilometers further to the north clearly has implications for crew, composition, family structure, ties to processing from an economic perspective, and so on. Not to mention the entire disappearance of fishing communities uh, throughout the data set that became visible. But, and I had to learn this, that what is implied, even if corroborated by 20 years of social science experience, my own, kind of qualitatively working with communities, that no matter what I, what I knew or could say about these fishing communities was speculation. That is, from this kind of hard science perspective, it's like, you know, show me the data, right? And if I were to just sort of riff uh, based on my own experience for 20 years, that was a never, you couldn't write that into this article. You could only write into this article the um, statistical significance of the data, right, as the proof for the phenomenon actually happening. So while I found this frustrating, I could also see a powerful plus side to it. 
That is, while these adaptations have already been documented by fishery social scientists via ethnographic interview and other methods, their results have been less scalable. That is, unable to encompass all communities across the entire coast. Right? My work is focused on a few communities. They, that kind of work is less combinable with measures and projections of climate change and less mobile in terms of where and how such results might find purchase. Which is simply to say that these scientists that I work to, when they put an, out an article like this, they get telephoned by the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, and they actually have interviews based on their findings, right? In ways that I never get that. So the article was picked up by various <coughs> news outlets and was, uh, what was most interesting about those reports, those articles, was how they foregrounded the fate of communities. That is, despite all the objective science terminology and the relative burying of implications in this very academic, um, particular kind of academic, and algorithmically driven article, the press about the articles amplify the very impacts on and implications for communities. So these are just a sample of some of the articles that were published as a result of that paper, right, which um, came out in one of the nature journals. You know, and you can, I, I picked a whole bunch, but you can start to see the word community, fishing communities, fishing, right, like fishing communities start to become real again. So this project uh, made clear that communities at sea, as an algorithm, could be associated and entangled with a range of powerful actors uh, and agencies focused on the problem of climate change. And in so doing, the concerns of community could be amplified beyond the confines of any one community to a region-wide analysis. And I think the other point to stress is that a lot of the, the friends that I've worked with, you know, before I engaged with them, you know, they did all kinds of work, and a lot of that work never refers to communities. It refers to the fishing industry. It refers to, you know, the sector of an industry, but it doesn't refer to communities. So, okay. So at the same time, communities go from an area associated with a port and a gear type to a dynamic entity that moves responds to environment, adapts in particular and statistically significant ways. We can see the beginning of a kind of modeling potential in alignment with other modeled oceanic entities and actors. And in so doing, communities are reified and amplified as ontological foundations for analysis, knowledge production, and ocean planning. In some sense, we see the beginning of a movement <coughs> from community as only and always a site of impact, ex maybe expressed on a map, to an, uh, uh, some kind of force with agency, with distinct capacities and potentials. Okay, so that's that project. I've got 10 minutes left or so, right? Okay, the um, next project that I want to show you is, uh, was in collaboration with what's called the Natural Capital Project, which is a group out of Stanford University in California, whose goal is to value nature and motivate greater and more targeted natural capital investments. So they're all about like, ecosystem services, basically, which, um, if you know that term, um, you may be critical of it if you're a critical social scientist. You may not. Um, anyway. In this project, the goal was to assess which communities along the entire coast were exposed to risk under climate change based upon water temperature projections. So now we're talking about, like, if we can project habitats into the future, who's really at risk? Who's going to bear the brunt of those environmental changes? And this is because fish habitat is largely governed by temperature, and it's possible to estimate where those optimal habitats for each species will be found in the future. Like, where are we going to find codfish? Where are we going to find halibut? And so forth and so on. This can then be used to assess exposure by community 
based upon where they traditionally go fishing. So these are, you know, the communities that see data that I do. Uh, this is it for different gear types. You can see for large trawlers, these different colored blobs are kind of the territories of use by different communities up and down the coast, and the same for small trawlers, mule nets, long liners, and so on. And so what we did in this project was taking that data, and this, you know, again, you gotta get your head around these graphs and not be afraid of them. So in the upper left, what you see is those areas that are community designated, community ter territories, arguably commons that communities use, and underlying it quite literally is the habitat range, another color, for a particular species. In this case, on the upper uh, right, it's um, the species we're talking about is the famous Atlantic cod, which I think you here in Portugal have heard about. The, um, the, the codfish, right, the codfish likes a particular temperature, and that habitat is moving rapidly more. What you see on the right-hand side is a graph for um, every community that relies on catching codfish. So these are all communities up and down the coast of the, the Northeast, and they all rely on codfish. And then with the graph above each name, right, so that's the name of every community this way, above it what you see is the area that that <coughs> community goes fishing. Is that area suitable for codfish? in the future. And if the colored bar was above that dotted line, it would be suitable for codfish. If the bar is below, it's unsuitable for codfish. So what it's saying is that all these communities that rely on codfish, 20 years in the future, there'll be no codfish in those places, right? Based solely on habitat and temperature. This is all we're talking about. On the bottom is the same thing for another species, monkfish. And what you can see is the communities that are further north, in this case, monkfish habitat remains appropriate for those northern communities. But for the southern communities, the monkfish is gone. OK, let me see if we have another. You can take that, those results, and this is a little hard to read, right? It, it, this is all about communities. It doesn't look like it, but this is exactly what this is. So. Now the communities are all lined up on the uh, top to bottom uh, for different gear types. So you know, large trawling Portland, Maine, uh, for example, those black dots are saying, well, each black dot is a species that Portland, Maine really relies on, right? They catch a mix of species. And the line down the middle of the graph is now saying, well, if you're to the right of that line, that species will be available in the future. If it's to the left of the line, it's saying it won't be available. And then the colored dot is the average for all of them. So Portland, Maine, the orange dot is way over on the left-hand side, which is saying most of your species are not going to be available in 20 years that you rely on today. Right? And so for every community, you can see whether, on average, they're going to fare better or worse uh, for, for given the mix of species they catch. Now what you see is that like most are left of the line rather than right of the line. Okay. <coughs> so this analysis, perhaps more than any of the others, translates climate change into a community level threat specified for each community given the locations and species upon which the community is most dependent. The work implies a kind of rescaling of climate change imaginaries, as well as responses uh, by different communities. Perhaps a rescaling of ecosystem services to community concerns and common environments, rather than only sectoral or industrial investments. Importantly, it does this work by modifying the algorithm such that it works with other accountings to form composite indices, and it does so across the entire region. The analysis itself amplifies communities at sea to be an expansive phenomenon, relevant and informative to individual communities, but also useful insofar as it implies region-wide dynamics and adaptation challenges. Again, we see a kind of movement from putting on the map to something more dynamic a set of dynamic processes, suggesting that actions can be taken across scales and sites 
to mitigate impacts, to adapt to future ocean conditions, and to possibly innovate toward more sustainable local and regional um, fishing practices. And that such, uh, such impacts, adaptations, and innovations can be differentiated across communities. OK, so that's that project. It differs insofar as this project foregrounds past responses of fishing communities. So rather than this kind of projection into the future, the idea is to um, characterize fishing communities based on past um, uh, patterns of fishing. And to think about that as a kind of capacity for adaptation. So if a targeted species moves substantially north, for example, did a community respond by fishing further north, as we talked about earlier? Or did they switch species? Or perhaps they changed their port association to a new location? And can we use, can we use these responses to characterize and perhaps produce a typology of fishing communities based on their adaptive capacities? So I'll just, I'm going to move a little quicker. So, so for example, fishing grounds, we simply developed uh, an index um, that more or less measures fidelity to traditional fishing grounds. And what we saw is that even in gear types that are mobile gear, right, there's stationary gear types, you put a pot on the bottom of the ocean, you leave it there, and then there's mobile gear types, which is you drag a net and you go all over the place that even the mobile gear types had a very high fidelity to fishing grounds. Which is to say, from a more social science perspective, that environmental knowledge makes a big difference, right? That tradition makes a big difference, that learning how to fish from your father makes a big difference, right? Where to catch fish is something that's not as simple as where the fish are located, and I'll go there. Uh, so we saw that, and we created an index around this kind of shifting of fishing grounds, we did see, as we mentioned before, that there were some large trawl communities that have followed fish dramatically, that story about Beaufort, North Carolina. But by and large, that's the exception. There is, move, there is movement um, even within traditional fishing grounds. We identified movement further toward colder water, which is to say a kind of more localized adaptation to changing um, habitat. Uh, but not a dramatic move away from traditional fishing grounds. That's more or less what those maps show, using a statistical measure, blah, blah, blah. Um, <coughs> and, and so if you characterize every community in terms of its fidelity to fishing grounds, it can tell you a lot about its capacity to adapt, right? It never moved fishing grounds in the past. Why would it do so in the future? Um, you can also uh, make it in, create indices around shifting target species. Basically the same question, did they shift to new species in the past or were they dedicated to a single species over time, right? And you can create an index of that and suggest that that is a kind of adaptive capacity. If they shift species a lot, well, they're probably going to keep doing that into the future and that could be really useful. If the codfish are gone, you can shift to another species. Right? So we created a set of indices around that. Uh, and then similarly with uh, trying to create indices around association with, uh, with ports. Did they, did they actually leave their home port and start working out of another port, right? And that, what we saw is that there is a trend toward that mobility. Um, the graph is telling you on the, on the left-hand side is kind of the before, and on the right-hand side is the after. The two top boxes are for particular gear type, before and after. The red bar is telling you basically we stay home a lot. Um, the, gr the green and the blue, as that increases, that simply indicates landing in other places. So when you look at the right-hand side, you can see there's a lot more green and blue, which means that fishing communities are, are the vessels themselves are landing in other ports more frequently. Uh, and that, that's, a, you know, that's a huge concern to the transformation of these communities um, and their sort of cohesiveness and so on. And what you see there is that what looks like mobility increasing up and down turns out to be mobility from particular ports to particular ports. And what you see is a kind of consolidation of fishing effort in fewer and fewer port locations, which is to say other ports are being abandoned. Right? So this increase in mobility isn't everybody going everywhere. 
it's leaving small ports and going to big ports, basically. Okay, um, this project, and I'll, I'll just, one more thing about it and then I'll finish up on the last point. This project is a partnership with the National Marine Fisheries Service, which is our federal agency that manages fisheries. And the indicators that we're developing stand a very good chance of being developed into ongoing databases used for actual fisheries decision making. Which is to say this project will be directly enrolled into frameworks of fishing decision making and impact analyses that have until now been essentially devoid of communities. So here, not only does community end up in the Wall Street Journal, community is going to be ended up in indices that are uh, kept by the National Marine Fisheries <coughs> Service and used in decision-making action. Okay, the very last thing to note is, is uh, I told you we might be able to get back to, um, we might be able to get back to the humanities at the very end, which is, and you probably won't be convinced, but the last thing is those indicators, those communities that see data, a lot of that work, um, we're partnering with the Nature Conservancy, um, which you've probably heard of, right, this international organization. Um, and the Nature Conservancy is building this thing called the Marine Mapping Tool. Um, and the Marine Mapping Tool lets you uh, identify a box off the coast. You can draw it, you know, you can draw an area. And then you can get all this data about what's in that area you just drew. Okay, this is like, you know, Geographic Information Systems 101, right? Very, very basic kind of thing. But making it available online and making it really targeted to a specific thing. And what it's doing is it's really, a, it's driven a lot by wind energy interests, which is to say we want to put wind energy there. What else is there already, right? That's kind of the question. Um, and it has a lot too with climate change, which is to say, how is that area going to change into the future? And the, when you do the query, what you get on the left are all this data about species and how they're changing, how, how, what's their density there, and so on. Also on the left at the bottom, what you see are all the biophysical features, sea surface temperature, oxygen, blah, 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 all these kinds of other things that have to do with the biophysical. And then, thanks to our project, in the middle, what you get are communities. And you get how many communities rely on that area for their livelihoods. Um, we can ask what's the diversity of fishing activity in that area. We can also, given projections into the future, what is the change in fishing opportunities in that area and so on. So it arguably brings to a data portal that's all about industrial um, uh, blue economy development this ontological foundation, I would argue, for a different way of thinking called community. And so in there, uh, and the Nature Conservancy being the, the sort of wonderfully uh, interdisciplinary liberal folk that they are, they're also interested in uh, what we've proposed, which is not only could you link uh, that data about communities and fishing, you could also link to existing oral history archives, right? So, the National Marine Fisheries Service has this vast archive of oral history stuff, which was really to kind of placate the anthropologists. And they have this huge thing, it just sits there, and it's totally disconnected from ocean planning and fisheries management. And one of our goals is to say, well, when you query this area, you're going to get oral histories about that location and about the people whose lives there, the history of those communities, and so on, will also be directly linkable to those areas in the ocean. And then we're also hoping to work with the uh, New Bedford Fishing Heritage Center, which is a small museum in New Bedford, Massachusetts, dedicated to the fishing industry and livelihoods, really from a kind of labor perspective. Uh, and what we have a plan there, if we can get the funding, we're working on it. The plan there is to set up an exhibit called Knowledges of the Sea, and to have a kind of interactive place where people can uh, input into a growing database vernacular place names for the ocean and connect those to stories as well. Really making a new layer of data that um, can be plugged into these planning portals that would reveal a kind of uh, local knowledge and vernacular naming of places, right? So it's all about making community visible, right? In ways that are more than just that's where community is. 
but like how can we start to get at the dynamics and the processes, the relationships between communities and the sea in more complicated ways? Um, and, and I'll end there. And, and thank you uh, for your attention. Much appreciated.